This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. And now I would like to introduce Martin and Gokchen, uh, two of our speakers who will be talking about deep learning and DNA. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, great. I've never given a lecture at university, but now I know how it feels like. It's amazing. A room half full of people behind their computers. It's great. Okay, so we're going to talk about deep learning of biological sequences today. Biological sequences, with that we mean DNA. And we're going to do this with Python and Keras. Um, we are Gertchen over here, and me, I'm Martin. We are both working at the Institute of Computational Biology at Helmholtz Center in Munich. Uh, Gertchen is a computer scientist by training who moved to computational biology. Um, I'm a biochemist, I studied biochemistry here in Munich, and I moved to computational biology during my PhD. Okay, I think the important question is, why do we talk about deep learning? A, because it's a hype thing and it attracts people usually, but B, the, the, the other, other reason is deep learning is actually very, very useful in many cases in applications of biology. And I think the main reason for that and why it's uh, so complicated for us in many cases to understand biology and biological systems and why deep learning can help is the inherent complexity of living organisms and living things. And this is because there are uh, a lot of very, very unique features basically of, of biology and bi biological systems that make these things so difficult, difficult to understand and so, uh, so special and so different from the non-living world sort of. One thing, of course, is nonlinearity. Everything in bio biology is nonlinear. Very subtle changes in, I don't know, let's say the neurotransmitter levels in your brain, for example, can cause drastic changes in your behavior. Another thing you have to know about biological systems is they are not in equilibrium. So they have to be actively maintained. We are sort of local minima of entropy, and that's the only reason why we live. And most of our energy goes into maintenance of this system. Biological systems are generally coupled, which is somehow very different from many things that, for example, physicists study. So if I drop this presenter to the floor, I can essentially calculate the time it will take to reach the floor without having to consider the quantum mechanics inside uh, this thing um, or the black hole in the center of a universe. In biology, it's very, very difficult to decouple the organism, for example, and the interactions between organisms and molecular, um, the molecular findings Another important factor is that biological systems have plasticity. It means they learn and adapt and they can change. If you hit somebody once, you might fool him. If you hit somebody a second time, he will react. And all these features essentially lead to the maybe most interesting part, to the emergence of complex shapes. Again, the non-living world has interesting things like a rock. Right? But biology gives rise to very complex features and shapes in organisms. In order to create these, uh, these complex shapes and maintain them, biological systems have to be tightly regulated. And as I mentioned earlier, this is where, I don't know, maybe 80% of our energy uh, goes into the re regulation and maintenance of these complicated organisms. And in the very end, maybe the most striking feature of biology, and I think maybe the most important one, is randomness. So we are the product, sort of, of three billion years of evolution, right? And what is evolution? It's random reshuffling of, of our genome, our genome sequence, which directly leads us to, uh, to the topic today. Yes, deep learning, but it is deep learning of biological sequences. And our genome is a sequence of four letters, A, C, G, and T. It's about 3.2, 3.3 billion, billion letters long, and you can essentially consider it to be a long book or something. The problem is we can't read this book. We don't understand the language, we don't understand the grammar, so we can't read it. We're trying to figure this out. And this is sort of the key concept or idea or principle of biological research. We, we are trying to figure out the interactions of our genes and genotype of our genome, on the one hand, and of complex traits, of diseases, of who we are and what we are on the other side. So this is a part of our genome. This is how it looks like. We don't know how it works. We're trying to figure out how it works. And this is something where deep learning tools come in very handy because of their specific advantages, I think. And 
This will be explained to you by Gert Chan. Thank you. Uh, hi, it's great to see so many people here. Um, so I'd like to start with the story of uh, sequence prediction in, in our field, computational biology. Uh, as Martin nicely explained, it's all about these interactions between these key components in the cell, uh, like these proteins, blue blobs here, and the DNA. So these interactions are so crucial for the cell, even for the preserving the identity of the cell or functioning of the cell and so on. So these patterns that these proteins recognize, patterns of DNA, is also crucial. So we are aiming to just discover these patterns and then basically train classifiers on these sequences. So this is the whole idea of uh, sequence classification. I'd like to start the story with um, a, a scientist from the United States, Gary Stormo. So he, made, uh, he did his PhD in, uh, in 80s and basically he, maybe he published the first paper to uh, classify sequences. So this, this is one of the earliest papers from 1982, I think. And what he did was to propose a new method to classify DNA or RNA sequences. So here we see uh, some sequences, some positive samples and some negative samples. And this is basically the training algorithm for this classification. But I think the most fascinating thing is that he used perceptrons to do the classification. So even I can read the title for you, use of the perceptron algorithm to distinguish translational initiation sites in E. coli. And the interesting and the re relevant part for this paper is that uh, the perceptron algorithm that he used in the 80s is basically uh, something like the grandfather of deep learning and, and, and neural networks. So in this setting, basically, he used the binary classifier, binary, um, binary perceptrons. It's a linear uh, classifier. And today, this technique is not really used. But uh, at the time, it was quite innovative. And I think it was a quite important technique. But this technique that he basically proposed is, uh, so basically he proposed the weighting matrix. So we generate this weighting matrix to just weight these sequences. And in the end, it, it leads to some kind of score for given sequences. And this score is basically the prediction whether the, the protein will bind or not, for example, because we have two classes here. And this matrix is called PWMs today. It's position weight matrices. And this forms the basis of all traditional uh, pattern discovery or motif discovery, as it's called in the computational biology. And uh, we still call them PWMs, but the methods are slightly different. It evolved over time uh, from 80s to today. Uh, but this still forms the, the basis of the motif discovery research today. And here I, I would like to give some examples to make it more concrete. And um, so this is, for example, one data that we get from the, from the lab, from biology labs. And this basically, so the x-axis is the genome. And y-axis tells us how likely it is for protein to bind to, to the given position. So for example, these peaks represent now the, the binding site with some uncertainty. So we don't know exactly where it binds, but this gives us some idea about the, the binding site and the position of the protein. So from these um, positions, we can just extract the sequences since we know the sequence of the genome. And then we try to basically train a classifier using these sequences. So this is what the sequences look like. And let's assume that there are some uh, eight positions that the protein bind. And uh, we just align these sequences and construct this matrix here. OK? Um, then we can just basically count all these letters in every position. And then this forms the basis of this PFM. So it's called position frequency matrix. But what we do is just to count how many letters we have for each position. So this is like just a basic count matrix. By just normalizing these metrics, we can just use it directly as a classifier. And this is, for example, we can also visualize it. Just imagine that we just divide these numbers by eight, because we have eight binding sites. And this will lead to, to probabilities for every position. And basically, it's like a multinomial or like categorical distribution and the maximum likelihood <coughs> formula. It's just uh, like a probability matrix. And then we can visualize it to see like, which letters that the protein prefers to bind for every position. So C and G, for example, in these positions are quite important. And if we have some ideas about the background information or some prior knowledge about, about the background of the genome, we can also incorporate this, uh, this information. So we can transform this count matrix to something including the, the background information. For example, you can use uh, equal probabilities for A, C, G, and T's, and this can be your background. Or if you have a more specific idea, 
about the composition of these letters in, in a specific region, then you can also reflect this information here as a background. But in the end, it doesn't uh, really matter. So the, what I would like to say is just uh, we construct some kind of scoring matrix for this binding size, and then we use this matrix to, to make predictions. And this is how we do it. For example, uh, we now have this PWM, the, the weight matrix. And then for a given sequence of DNA, for example, you can imagine that this part is like the training now, and we are doing some predictions. And for a given uh, sequence, what we'd like to do is basically take the row corresponding to each letter and then sum up all these scoring values, right? So if these values are, for example, high, then uh, this, this overall will generate a high value, and this will be our score for this specific uh, sequence. Then when we sum them up, we uh, end up with this small uh, number, which is five in this case. Uh, but this gives an idea about how uh, likely it is to bind to the, for the protein to bind to this sequence. And we can also calculate the maximum for this, and then we can just normalize it and get a nice uh, value, for example, 78%. So this is how it's done in, in a traditional sense. The, the, the real algorithm is, is slightly more sophisticated, like the ex expectation maximization used, but there are many different probabilistic uh, mechanisms or like probabilistic models being built on top of this idea. And today it's like the mainstream research in this topic. But now the idea is how to use this matrix to just scan the entire genome and then find new and discover new binding sites, right? And this is how we do it. I prepared like a nice um, illustration for you. So just, so just imagine that this is like the full genome now and we know the sequence and this is the pattern that we're interested in. So this is the, the scoring matrix that we, that we derived, for example. Now the idea is to scan the genome and then uh, detect some, some binding sites. So this is how we do it. Just uh, we put the, the scoring matrix and for each corresponding position we just take the uh, element wise product and then sum them up. So for example now this uh, filter is overlapping with these two, three letters and then we just uh, multiply and sum them up and then we end up with one scalar value. So in this case for example uh, this weight, this weight matrix corresponds to ATC. This is clear right? Because every row uh, corresponds to one letter. So this, the responsibility of this matrix is to just recognize or some uh, generate high values when it encounters ATC value. So here we have ATG, so it still uh, pr uh, produces a high value, but not as high as ATC. And this, represent, this color represents the, uh, the magnitude of the value that it produces. So we keep uh, scanning the genome and then uh, calculating these values. And then, for example, if we hit an ATC, uh, which is like the main pattern that we would like to uh, determine and, and detect, we get a very high value here. It's represented as black here. And we keep uh, scanning the genome, and in the end, what we produce is this long vector and uh, some scores for each position. And one a naive idea, and the sim maybe the simplest idea, is to just uh, apply some kind of thresholding and then take this side as a binding side. So this is how we can make a prediction. But up to this point, I didn't talk anything about neural networks and, and, and convolutional neural networks and deep learning and so on. So this is still the main and basic idea of how to use this scoring matrix to find new binding sites. But the procedure that I described is basically how convolution works in general. And it also forms the basis of the convolutional neural networks and how we detect patterns using, the, using deep learning. So now let's take a look at how uh, convolutional neural networks use the same idea to detect more complicated patterns. Um, so before just describing uh, and giving the same example and use, applying deep learning to the same example, just a brief overview of uh, how, how deep learning works. So um, if you remember the uh, linear classifiers, so without any hidden layers, deep learning is basically just something like lo logistic regression. We, we can tra train a, a linear classifier which can try to discriminate two classes using this line here. But we, as we add more layers and more nonlinearity to the, to the classifier, so it enables us to just uh, classify, for example, this kind of more complicated and uh, linearly non-separable classes. And the idea of uh, convolutional neural networks in the sequence prediction context is to basically um, do the same, that we, the, exactly the same thing that we did with the, the scoring matrix, but using this time multiple scoring matrices. So for example, here we have again the same uh, input sequence, and these are again the filters or PWMs, uh, but in this time, we just initialize and optimize them 
such that we get different matrices from the, different, from the same input. So this filter, for example, recognizes ATC, but this one, for example, responds to TCT pattern. And then uh, after we just convolve this filter with this input sequence, we get this vector as I, exactly the same way as I just described in the pre previous slide. And uh, this filter leads to this kind of sequence. And then we stack them up and then we pass this new information or the new representation of the sequence to the next layers. So now we represent the same sequence, not using these letters, but in terms of these new filters and their responses. So in this case, for example, this black box represents ATC and these black boxes represents TCT. So as we go further in the next layers, what we describe or what we discover is like not just patterns, but patterns of patterns. And uh, the idea is to just randomly initialize these filters and then optimize it during the training using stochastic gradient descent. So we don't use any kind of um, like knowledge about like we don't initialize it to some known motifs or like motifs or patterns discovered previously, but we just initialize it randomly and then uh, optimize it during the, during the training. But the key point is now we have a different representation for the same input. And as we go further in the next layers, this, this representation also transforms and transforms. And in the end, it enables us to just fit one linear classifier so that we can nicely separate between these two, uh, these two classes. So as I said, this is now the new representation and then we have new filters and we again uh, do the same operation over and over again. But one of the important thing is that uh, we now have some kind of nonlinearity because we know that these new features, uh, if we use these new features, the data is still not linearly separable. So we need to add some kind of nonlinear functions to just generate uh, new representations. So convolution and followed by some nonlinear operation is basically uh, what we do in convolution neural nets. And to make it more translationally, uh, to gain some translational invariance, we can use uh, something called max pooling. Uh, which is basically just splitting the sequences to the equal sized bins and then taking the maximum value in these bins. So for example, we take the darkest uh, squares from these regions and then put them together and then just pass this to the next layer. And this is basically, this gains some kind of translational invariance. And it means that, for example, if we, see, if we shift the entire sequence to the left by just one uh, position, one square, then this representation doesn't change. This is also clear, right? Because we just take the maximum within the bin, so it is just more robust to this small shifting. And now we do it again and again, and then in the end what we do is to just basically use something like logistic regression, a linear classifier to, uh, sequence, to, to classify the sequences. And we can summarize it like this. Uh, we have some function operating on the sequence, input sequence and some parameters. And this is like a nonlinear function, for example, convolution of the weights and the input, and then followed by some nonlinear operation. And this is like, we use multiple functions in a nested fashion. Now I'd like to show some Python code and how to implement it. So um, this is one of my favorite motifs. It's quite simple and easy to see. <laughs> and it's a real motif. So we also observe this pattern in, in human genome, for example. And what I did was to just um, get this um, frequency matrix. So this is just the PFM that I just mentioned. So this, these, this matrix basically represents this motif now. And what I did was to just uh, generate new sequences based on this pattern and then use it as a positive sample in the training set. So now we have the sequences and then I added some random letters to the left side and to the right side and then generated some new sequences like this. So it's just sampling from the categorical distribution based on the, on the probabilities that we obtain from this matrix. And this is basically our positive set now. So this is like the positive class, like the, the binding site of the protein, for example. And here in the center, we can clearly see the pattern because it's really obvious and it's a very small, uh, clear, simple pattern. And on the left and right side, we just have some random letters. And for the negative set, I just constru constructed the, this matrix uh, completely randomly. So the, the, the probability for each letter is, is equal. And this, is, this basically uh, forms the, the negative set for the training. So we can just combine them and then cl uh, train a classifier using uh, deep learning framework Keras. Uh, but before that, the, the one important step is to just do this binary encoding that I, uh, that I showed you. So if um, so instead of using these letters that we see here, 
we just encode the matrix so that the, the rows represent the ACGT and columns represent the positions. And then it's now represented in a binary form. So for example, in this case, we have 1,000 positive samples and 1,000 negative samples. And then when we change the encoding, uh, so the, the, the sequence length is 40. So the, uh, the shape of the matrix is 1,000 by 40 now because of 1,000 samples and 40 is the sequence length. But when we do this binary encoding, it becomes like a 3 uh, the tensor, so 1,000 by 40 by 4, and 4 represents these four letters. And now it's quite sparse binary tensor. And basically it looks like this. So we have just ones in the corresponding positions. So this is, for example, C, G, C, A, T, T, and so on. And this is only one, like on the beginning of one training sample. Um, then this is the Keras part. This is like the, the, the deep learning part. So, um, so Keras is, is a deep learning framework in Python. It's, it's extremely easy to use. You can just uh, design a convolutional neural net network in 10 lines or so, and then you can train it. So here, for example, we see that like, we start the model and then one, add one convolution layer. Uh, then there's a dropout layer for regularization. And then we flatten everything, and there is one output node which will emit basically the probability for these two classes. And then I did something a bit interesting, I think, because uh, in this convolution layer, there, this is uh, the size of the filter. So I used only one filter, only one matrix, only one PWM, uh, to do this classification. And the length of the filter is 90. So you can use it here, let's see it here. So it's like one uh, matrix of length uh, 90. And this is the only thing that, that will recognize some pattern and then enable us to, to classify these uh, sequences. So in real world applications, of course, they, uh, people use like hundreds of different uh, filters and hundreds of them in each layer. And then uh, there are multiple layers. So in total, there are maybe thousands of different such filters. But for, this, for the simplicity of this example, I just use only one filter. So this part is also important. Then we have this, uh, yeah, and the nonlinearity is basically defined here. It's something called rectified linear unit. Then we have the complete design of the, of the um, neural net. And we can just fit it in one line. It can also split the validation set. And these are the, uh, the accuracy values that we see here. So this is the training accuracy, and this is the validation accuracy. And, uh, and this basically represents how many times we pass through the entire training set. So when we just consume the entire training set, the, the accuracy values are already very high. But then as we uh, train the model with the same sequences over and over again, the, the accuracy just increases to 99% for the validation set. But of course, this is like a very toy example. We can even uh, see the sequences easily. We can even discriminate them by just looking at the sequences. Uh, but this gives us an idea about how simple it is to just apply these concepts to the sequences. And by the way, this is exactly the same code that you can use uh, for image recognition for any other type of uh, applications that you can use for convolution, for example. The only difference is that the convolution is one dimensional here. So if you remember this, uh, this matrix sliding uh, through the sequence, it slides in only one direction. So it starts from the beginning of the centers and go through the sequence to the end. But in images, it's just two dimensional. So it's two dimensional convolution. It just slides from left to right and also from top to bottom. But this is just a, a small detail, so the entire design and the, the algorithm is exactly the same when you classify cat pictures and dog, dog pictures, for example. And now the interesting part is, um, so after the training, we have this high super accuracy value. Um, then we can look at this single filter that we used in the training, and we can examine basically what it learned, and we can just uh, try to print what we have in this filter. And since we have only one filter, only one uh, PWM, we can just print what values we have in there. And this is what we do here, basically. Uh, we take the first layer, the convolution layer, and then we get, we get the, the, the weights of these layers, so which is the PWM, basically, the matrix that we use in the uh, classification. Um, then this is the shape, 19 by 4. 4, again, represents the letters, and 19 is the width of the filter. Then we just convert the highest, um, convert the highest columns in the, in the matrix to these letters. And then the result is, is quite nice because we see exactly the same pattern that we see here in the motif. So this was the, this was the pattern that we used to generate this toy uh, example, the training set. And then uh, 
the way that, that neural network classifies these sequences is basically to learn this pattern, exactly the same pattern, these GGs and AAs. And this is the only pattern that it should recognize in order to perfectly split uh, the positive and negative samples. So this also kind of validates that, that um, the, the, the method is working. But for more complicated uh, convolutional neural nets, it's not easy to just interpret things because we have many filters and uh, if you just look at the weights in the, in the first convolution layer, uh, it will transform, it will, um, there will be many different transformations in the, in the subsequent layer, so it's not just easy to uh, print the, the weights and then interpret them. But in, this is a special case where we use only one filter, so it just makes sense to see, uh, it's so easy to see what uh, network really learns from this data. So we see the, the pattern and we are done. Um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, There's one more thing. I have to use this microphone. The other one calls the feedback. Sorry. <laughs> Can we? Oh. Perfect. Thank you. Um, 20 seconds of shameless advertising. So recently got some pre-seed funding for a startup working on data integration and data modeling in biology. And as everybody these days, we're looking for people, of course. So if you're interested in this scientific background, if you're interested in, in Python backend development, uh, or alternatively in user interface and user experience design with a scientific background, you should come talk to us. Um, my email address is here. Uh, email me if you're interested. Okay, uh, that's it, I think. If you have any questions, we have about two minutes left. There's a question in the very center. Yes, we did, and multi-omics data works quite nicely, I think. Maybe not multi-omics, but like integrating the sequence data, uh, as well as some other different data sources, like epigenetics data, for example. Then it really increases the, the, the prediction accuracy. But about the, the prior knowledge, I think there are some papers uh, where people use these um, the already known motifs to initialize these filters, and they report some kind of speed up. So we initialize it uh, more wisely than random initialization by the, the knowledge that we already know about these sequences, and this also kind of improves the, the predictions. One more question. Um, how, how high is the chance of overfitting in this case, or do you don't have any case of overfitting? Um, overfitting is quite likely, I think, uh, but you should just think about some regularization um, mechanisms, but there are like, maybe five different ways to, to regularize the model so that you can get rid of overfitting. And it's basically a balance between the number of parameters that we have in the model and then the number of samples we have. So using this balance and some additional regularization mechanisms, we can just uh, get rid of overfitting I think, quite easily. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.